it's fair to say. Um, our founding fathers, many of you maybe were taught that in public school or Catholic school, um, would not be happy with our country right now because they um, really trusted in the providence of God. And when they wrote our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, you see God through the whole thing. You see that this country was founded on faith. This country was founded on integrity and principles that have to do with biblical principles principles and Judeo-Christian values. So I'm going to talk to you today about something that happened to me, that your confirmation, your baptism will really help you to process. But also, without your baptism, without your confirmation, um, you may not be able to handle the things that I'm going to share if they somehow in your future come to you. So to be an enemy of our current country and state, you have to be a Christian. All right. Pretty much that makes you an enemy of the state right now. Why? Because us as Catholic Christians, we support women who are in crisis pregnancies that are seeking abortions um, because they're scared. And our, our beliefs as Christians is that we do not kill. Right. Thou yeah. shall not kill. Right? You just you agree with that, don't you? Uh, so I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been going into the city of Philadelphia, traveling around the world, helping women and men in crisis, in a difficult situation, choose life. And this is the origin or genesis of my story to you today. It has a great ending. It involves those people back there, too. So they're gonna, you're going to know about them, and you can even ask them some questions if you want. This theme's about holy boldness, and it's about... Our baptism, and it's about courage. It's about fortitude in the midst of a culture that doesn't um, embrace our belief system, as I said, but also um, tells us that we should be in favor of child killing, infanticide. Okay? Is that too hard for you to hear right now? I hope, hopefully not. Hopefully you're all on board with that message. But you know what? I, I'm not naive enough to say that maybe some of you are a little on the fence with some of that. You're not even sure. And that's okay. You should ask questions, and certainly you should, you should get those questions answered. But our church teaches and our faith teaches that all life is sacred, from the womb to the tomb. And so this is what I espouse. This is what our church teaches, and this is what I do. So for 20 years, I've been going into the city of Philadelphia, which is three hours from here, north, and uh, I go in to pray. I go to pray and help people in crisis, in a difficult situation. And my wife and children, we've held these babies, the ones that we've helped. I'd say in the last 20 years, we've been a part indirectly and directly about 100 babies that were saved as a result of just showing up for work. And when I say just showing up for work, ladies and men, I mean the work of God. I mean, I don't mean just checking in and getting paid. I mean doing kingdom work, building up the kingdom of God. And that's what I do, and I've been doing that for 20 years. I do it full time. My son, in recent years, uh, has been coming with me to the city of Philadelphia. Now, he's 14. He was 12, oh, actually 11, when I started bringing him uh, down in the city. Now, I bring all of them with me at times, but he goes with me for four hours. So we'll get up. Sometimes we'll leave to go to the city at 8 or leave at 10 a.m. takes us two hours to get to the city of Philadelphia. It's like driving to D.C., right? D.C. is like two hours. Away. So he was like driving to D.C. So, and then we'll get there. And we'll, um, I'll tell him, did you bring your weapon? Did you bring your rosary, right? I think I have my weapon on me. Yeah. I said, did you bring your weapon? Yeah, Daddy, I got it. Okay, good, because we're going to pray. This is what we arm ourselves with, okay? For our Presbyterian girlfriend, this is uh, the rosary, okay? A holy rosary. Hopefully you know what that is. Um, nonetheless, uh, this is what we do when we get there. Mark, and Mark will say to me, Dad, let's pray it today in Latin. How many of you know Latin in here? Raise your hand if you know Latin. You speak fluently? No, no of course not. <laughs> no. Who really speaks Latin fluently? But I can tell you this, that the devil hates Latin. The devil hates Latin. So we pray our, our Father, we'll pray our Hail Mary, we'll pray it in Latin. And of course, these buildings, these places, they're infested with evil. You like that? They're infested with evil. The people themselves are not evil. But the building itself is evil, right? Like it's infested, it's saturated 
with evil. Now think about it. Babies are killed in this building where I go. So that's pure evil, right? That's intrinsically evil. And there's nothing good that ever comes from child killing, okay? Um, hopefully you're okay with that. You can hear that today, this morning. But that's important to know. And that's happening all around us. It used to be about 1.5 million a year in our country. It's a little less than that these days. Even though we overtone Roe v. Wade, um, we still have child killing in Pennsylvania just to the degree that we had prior to that. And many states are the same way. So we still have to fight and do a lot of good things to help babies be saved. Do you want this? Oh. To help babies be saved and, and get our nation to protect all life, right? All life is sacred. We the people, that's fine. Our, con our constitution was formed to protect all life, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So you know that, some of you guys know that. Let me get into the story. So on October 13th, the day the sun dance, that's the last day of the apparition of Fatima, I was with my son, 2021, in the city of Philadelphia, doing what we do, helping people. Um, I can't lift you because I, I, that wouldn't work for me. Okay, uh, as I'm presenting. <laughs> so on that day, uh, my son was uh, getting verbally abused. Let's just say it that way. Verbally abused by a volunteer at uh, Planned Parenthood. Now, you're, some of you guys have siblings, and I'm sure if you had a sibling that was being verbally assaulted or abused, you'd be very upset about it. Let's say your dad was there, and, uh, and all of you can answer this question by a show of hands. Let's say your dad was there, and you were being verbally abused or assaulted by somebody who's a complete stranger to you, and, uh, and your dad was watching this. What would your dad do? Raise your hand if you think your dad would get involved. Raise your hand. Okay? All right. Good. Almost all of you, if, if not all of you. Okay, so we can all agree that this is not right, that bullying and abusing uh, verbally, emotionally, uh, intimidating, psychologically, all those things are, are negative. And that's exactly what was happening that day. Now, you say, well, why would you bring your son into the city to experience that? Well, I don't bring him into the city to experience that. That's not why I bring him there. We're there for four hours. We're there to help people. We're a homeschool family. So we homeschool our kids are taught in the home. That's our school. And this is a homeschool lesson. And we have to teach how do we engage the culture? So this is back to our theme, holy boldness. How do you engage the culture in a bold, faith-filled way? Well, we have to train up young people in the way they should go. So I'm teaching my son how to engage the culture on the, on the life issue, okay? Good, bad, or indifferent, that's what's happening. On that day, he was getting bullied, harassed, intimidated, whatever you want to call it, by an escort, a guy I've known for 20 years. Now, I got involved, just like you said, your dad would get involved. And I made, the, I made it stop, okay? Suffice it to say, uh, I neutralized the man, and, um, and that was it. And my son was protected. We finished up. We went. We prayed for the man. We went. We did a holy hour for him. We had uh, a sandwich uh, on the steps of St. John the Evangelist in Philadelphia. Came back, made a statement to the police that were there, told them what happened. And he said, look, probably nothing's going to happen here. At least we're not going to do anything. But he may press charges against you, okay? So I, I intervened. I physically intervened. And I said, that's fine. No problem. So I went home. He put me in a private criminal complaint, which is nothing more than paying money to go into a court proceeding. Uh, and uh, it was dismissed. I won about five months later. Uh, it was dismissed, no, no uh, error on my part, okay? Basically, that's, the state of Pennsylvania said that, that man just took, did what he needed to do. It was just pushed from a man on the sidewalk. No problem, okay? All over. Well, the government was watching this. Your government, my government, about five days later, they served me a target letter, which means nothing to you, but it, it basically was saying, we, um, we might indict you, and there's a grand jury that may uh, decide to do this. It's basically all it said. So nothing happened, but it was, it was a scary letter to say, like, hey, we, we could charge you with a fed federal crime. So um, I said, well, okay. I had uh, my attorney contact them, and the attorney said, look, you have no case. My client is innocent. But should you want to arrest him or indict him, uh, just give us a call. We'll, we'll bring him down to you. No need to bring an agent out to his house, a federal agent. Scares kids. Just, you know, bring, we'll bring him to you, okay? You're probably like, what is this guy talking about? Well, this is big news. This was all over the world. What happened to me, what I'm about to share with you, the whole world knew about. Now, you may not know about it, but now you will. So um, the Dobbs case leaks in May. That means that Roe v. Wade's about to be overturned. It gets leaked. 
all right? That means it hasn't happened yet, but the world's getting a, 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 an understanding that it's going to happen. That happens in June 2024, excuse me, 20, June 24, 2022. Roe v. Wade's overturned. Then uh, President Biden comes to Philadelphia. He says to, and he's a Catholic, right? He's one part of the family. He says, um, we're going to defend abortion rights. And he did that in Philadelphia at the Independence Hall, right? Where our, all our rights were established, okay? And then the pro-lifers start getting arrested. My attorney contacts me in August of 2022. This is last year, 11 months ago. And he says, have you heard from the assistant U.S. attorney in Philadelphia? who was in charge of that letter that came to me from the U.S. Justice Department. It came from the government. And I said, no, I haven't heard from her. He said, well, she won't return my phone calls. And I said, okay, well, no big deal. Let's just move forward. Well, on the, on the, what I'm about to share with you next is, is what happened to, to these children, to this child, to this child, and those people back there. It was September 23rd at, on a Friday morning, about 6.30 in the morning, I was I had a quiche in the oven. I was making breakfast for my family. We're going to co-op that day. We're leaving the homeschool and we're going to co-op. How many of you in here are homeschooled? Okay, so you guys, all, most of you, a lot of you. So you know what we're doing. It's a big day. We get to leave the house, right? Everyone's happy. We get dressed up a little bit. We're not in our PJs all day doing homeschool. We're going to go out and see the world. We got a quiche in the oven and then there's a heavy banging at the door. Now, what I'm about to share with you is going to require your 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 confirmational gift of courage, fortitude, fear of the Lord, piety, knowledge, understanding, all of the gifts you receive, the seven gifts. It will require you to be able to use if if something like this should ever happen to you, and it might, right? Because just being a Christian, you're an enemy of the state. Okay, I'm not to scare you, but I'm just telling you, our belief system is not welcomed in this country right now from the highest office even though he would claim to be a christian they banged on my door someone banged on my door i don't know who it was it's a dark o'clock in this in in bucks county pennsylvania lux lot like this place front royal area and uh i didn't know who it was heavy banging on the door bang 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 doorbell doorbell ringing over and over again my whole house is lit up with noise seven children are sleeping you remember that yeah, he's, he's shaking his head. Seven children were asleep. Now, I didn't know who it was. But if someone bangs on your door like that and says, open up, which is what they said, what would you think? You would think crud? You would think something's not right, okay? All right, well, I didn't think that, but yeah, you could think that. What would you think if someone banged on your door and said, Bang, 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 bang. Door double, open up. Open up. That's all they say. Take it, Absolutely. No brainer. Okay, look. I live in Bucks County. It's the home of the deer. Everyone owns a gun in Bucks County. Okay? How many of your family members are gun owners? Good. Okay? I'm the only one in Bucks County who doesn't own a gun. Okay? But if I had one, I would have gone to the door with my gun because it sounds like a madman on the other side of the door. Right? Am I right? Yeah. Well, we don't know, right? No one. They just said open up. So I go to the door and I say, well, who is it? <laughs> right? And he says, the FBI, open up. Bang, 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 doorbell, doorbell, doorbell. I'm like, okay. And they're like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. This is what they're saying on the other side of the door. I'm like, I got a quiche in the oven. Like, everyone's chill here. Like, what's, stay calm, stay calm. I say this through the door. I have seven babies in here. Please stay calm. Now, my wife is stirring, but I don't know that she's up. I'm assuming she's up at this point. So I open the door. I show my hands because that's important. Make sure they can see your hands. I come out, and I'm going to describe to you what I saw, okay? Five federal agents on my porch. Picture like a long porch with a roof with M16 guns pointed at me. Okay, and this is how they, op they, they didn't announce that there was the FBI until I asked who it was. I have these long guns pointed at me. And then I have 10 marked and unmarked units on my front property surrounding my house, kind of like hugging my home with vehicles, lined up all the way to the road, 100 yards to the road, about 10. I, I, it could have been more. I'm going to say about 20 law enforcement, 
PA state troopers and which were fe and federal agents. All the PA state troopers behind their guns with their pistols drawn, or behind their doors rather, with their pistols drawn. Battering rams, he ballistic helmets, ballistic shields, heavily armored vests, ready to go. My daughter, Therese, you can ask her, takes note of two SWAT guys at the back of the door. So I don't know who's with long guns. I don't know how many are around the house. I'm just telling you what I saw. And I come out, now what would you, now what would you say if you weren't expecting this at your door? What, what would, dear, what would you say if you came out and weren't expecting it? Just real quick, what would you think to say? Hello? Can I help you? Yeah, I hope yeah. You. I said, I said the same thing. I said, uh, what are you doing here? Because I wasn't expecting anything. Remember, my attorney said, I'm innocent. There's case law in the area. Well, we'll come down to the federal building. No need to bring an agent out to the house. We're peaceful people. So I'm like thinking, did a deer get run over? Like, why so much, you know? And they didn't say anything. Remember Jesus in, in the Garden of Gethsemane? when the Sanhedrin soldiers come to arrest him and they say, we're here looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And they all like, kind of step back. But you know what happened? My home is enthroned to the sacred heart of Jesus. And so we have an image of the sacred heart. I believe that the Prince of Peace came out upon all of these men and women. And there were men and women there. And I said, uh, what are you doing here? And they said, you know why we're here. <laughs> now, I'm not a mind reader. And I didn't think crud. I thought, uh, no, I, I don't. Oh, you're here because I rescue babies. That's a true story. My wife comes down. <laughs> and she comes down. She's got a leopard bathrobe on. Do you guys like to wear leopard? Okay. <laughs> she does. And she's tightening it up. And she comes down and she says, do you have a warrant for his arrest? Well, that's a smart thing to say, right? I didn't even think to say that. I just said, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, like, I didn't, I didn't know. She's like, she's like all like ahead of me and she's got like all this planned out. What's going to happen next? Do you have a warrant for his arrest? You know, what the, you know what the FBI said? What do you think they said? Yes. They said, we're taking him with or without a warrant. Now in, in America, you cannot arrest somebody in their home on their private property without a warrant. You can't do that. It's against the law. And usually when these people come to your home, they put it right in your face and say, we have a warrant for your arrest. You're being charged for saying the word crud in public, right? <laughs> Whatever, right? Whatever the charge is, it's gonna be there in your face so that nothing bad happens. In fact, they might even stick it on the end of the rifle so that you can see it, or they'll paste it on your door. So there's no confusion because it's the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who knows everything about everything, right? Especially if a guy has a gun in his house. But I don't know, probably. So, uh, so she said, well, you can't do that. Because remember, I said, we're taking him with or without a warrant. Well, you can't do that because that's kidnapping at gunpoint. And so they didn't really know what to say to that. Now, I, I'm in a dad mode, protector mode. I got, don't touch the computer. Uh, <laughs> but dad mode, protector mode. I'm like, okay, this isn't good. My kids are awake. They're screaming on the doorstep. You would be screaming. They're all in their PJs. They're downrange, which means they're in the range. The rifles are in the threshold of the door, scanning the door, scanning everything. My children are downrange. Two years old at the time, four years old, six years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 11, 13 years of age. They were scared, as they should be. Okay. I recognized that. I said, okay, I'll go with you. Uh, can I put a shirt on? I had a t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops on. Sweatshirt on? No. Socks on? Can I put socks on? No. Can I put shoes on? No. Can I brush my teeth? No. Can I put some deodorant on? No. Can I take my rosary? This one. Yes. They let me take my rosary. How cool is that? All right, I'm going to fast forward to what happened next, and I'm going to close with the journey of the way of the cross, which is all about holy boldness and all about your baptism, and all about your confirmational gifts. So they take me down to the federal building, which is where 
100 yards where the Independence Hall is, where the constitutional rights were established, Declaration of Independence. Now, my wife doesn't know I left. They don't let me say goodbye to my children. They do produce, finally, a cover to a warrant, but they didn't say they had it. Eventually, they produced a cover. After the fact, after I was taken into custody. So, you see how that went. So I'm driving down, and I said, why so many of you? And the guy's from St. Louis, the agent, the other guy's from Delaware. And he said, well, sir, we know nothing about you. And I said, I find it really hard to believe that the FBI knows nothing about me. Okay. So we talked about Jesus. We talked about homeschooling. We talked about the Philadelphia Eagles, who are doing really well. And we made our way down to the federal building. Now, at the federal building, the driver has to leave. The guy from St. Louis, he says, it was a real pleasure meeting you. Yeah, that's kind of odd, right? Well, I mean, we proclaim Jesus in season and out of season. We're talking about God. He's, you have a beautiful family. I love your home. Tell me about homeschooling. I said, it's great meeting you. So let's do it same time next Saturday. Okay? <laughs> Just come a little later. I'll get my quiche done. But he did say that. Uh, hello? Let's leave that alone. So he did say that. They fingerprint me. Then they belly shackle me. What is a belly shackle? That's like cuffs, but around your waist. Yeah, I'm in their custody. Then they shackle my feet. I'm in their custody, right? You're like, why do you got to shackle this guy? I'm not even guilty of anything. I'm just allegedly guilty, right? Charged, presumed innocent till proven guilty, right? You've heard that before. No, that's not the case anymore. It may be the case on, on, on the books, but not this case. So keep in mind these things. It's important. You guys are going to be coming of age. You're going to be voting, some of you, soon. When you vote, you, you keep in mind these things. You keep in mind that your government arrests people in the middle of the night and scares little children, terrorizes little children. Why is this important for you to know? Because when tyrannies are coming and dictatorships are coming, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller from Germany came to my house two weeks after this and said, tyrannies and dictatorships are coming. When little children are woken up in their sleep and fathers are taken from them in the cover of midnight. This is important to remember. You can educate your family on these things if you want. But you are coming of age. You decide who's going to be the next leaders in this country. You. Keep this in mind. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to tell you. It's going to require courage. So... Then they take me to a white room in the federal building. They chain me to a table for six hours with my belly shackle and my ankles shackled. Now I have bare feet, bare ankles. And make sure that the, the, the cuffs are really tightly on my bone. That was fun. Because in our country, the process is the punishment. They don't care about conviction. They want to humiliate you. They want to intimidate and scare and scare. And they did. When I give these talks when they're on the this trip, this gratitude tour, we're calling it, come here, honey. These little ones don't like hearing this story sometimes because it reminds them of the terror that they experienced. Doesn't it? It's internal. How's this little boy supposed to process what just happened to him? How's he supposed to know what this all means? Don't cops arrest bad guys? Why are they arresting my daddy? You guys need to think about this. So I'm in a room by myself for six hours. Guess what? I never felt more close to Jesus in my entire life. I was at the foot of the cross. I could pluck a splinter off of the cross. I could touch Jesus. I could feel his presence. I was never closer to God in my entire life. I had perfect peace. Didn't know when I would return to my family. I don't know why I want to see him again. No one told me anything. They could keep me locked up just like they're keeping a lot of people locked up now and away from their families. And there I was. I just praying my rosary. And I'm praying with the litany of the saints. The, uh, uh, I'm praying with the communion of the saints. I'm praying with my guardian angels. I'm praying the prayer of St. Paul when he's chained in Rome and St. Peter all the martyrs and I'm feeling blessed all right I can't do this somebody come get these I can't hold them here and do this. I'm feeling blessed beyond 
anything I've ever felt before. And you're thinking, you just got terrorized, persecuted. Your kids are freaked out. You can stay here, but I can't hold you anymore. <laughs> Guys, I kid you not. My will and God's will were perfectly one. Now, I have been preparing, friends, for 20 years for this big moment. 20 years of my life. So God had been preparing me for this. And perhaps for such a time as this, God was really calling me. And I felt blessed and honored. And I had peace. Now, I didn't know what was going to happen. They were charging me with two violations against the FACE Act, freedom of access to clinic entrances, which was a bad law to begin with, designed to persecute pro-lifers. Don't have time to get into it. 11 years in federal prison, $350,000 in fines, three years supervised probation. Basically, we're yours for the next 14 years of your life. And I'm a dad. I got kids. I got a wife. But it is what it is. So you just accept those consequences, you know, and you move forward. After about six hours, they said, we're going to release you. And what does that tell you? Being released means that you're not a flight risk, a threat to the community, or a violent offender. That's what that means. So the government knew all this. But they still wanted to terrorize these little people. And we said we would come right in. And by the way, you know where he is every Wednesday, we said. You can pick him up on the street. Don't need to hurt his family. This is what happened. This is why the whole world came around to support my family. I had Mother Teresa's nuns in Calcutta praying for these kids. Praying at her sarcophagus where her body is with a picture of our family. I had the whole world sending messages. A village in Uganda says, we're praying for you. I had a guy in the United States reach out to me and he said, I'm a lousy Catholic, but seeing what's happened to you is bringing me back to the church. And I thought, wow, I didn't say no more. Like one soul saved by me just showing up for work, doing the work of God. That's it. A soul saved. I'm done. Save a soul, save your own soul. Right out of scripture. So I'm like, wow, unworthy me. So we go home. Actually, before I go home, they take me to U.S. Marshals. They keep me chained like an animal. I'm being released back to my family, back to the world. But yet they still want to keep me in shackles. What do you think they want to plant? A seed in my mind that says, don't mess with the government? Why would they do that? I don't know. I, I don't know why they did that. They had no reason to do it. But there I was, like Jim Caviezel in The Passion of the Christ, just walking with my shackles from the sixth floor to the, to the basement. I said to the agent, I said, is this really necessary? I said, do you have a, a heavy cross for me to carry? And he says, no, I don't have a heavy cross for you. I said, well, I can tell you it's coming. So here's the holy boldness. And that, the next thing I'm going to tell you in the next 22 minutes is the way of the cross. That all of you must travel. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus says that every day. So you have to tra travel your own way of the cross. You're old enough to handle it. Life's hard. You, some of you already know it. Some of you know how hard life can be. Some of you have lost parents. I lost a dad when I was 11. Some of you have divorced parents. Some of you have friends that died. Some of you have things that have happened that have really crushed your spirit. You know what that cross can be. But you're going to have to carry that every day. And there will be new crosses and new things coming your way. And God will give you the grace to carry it. And God gave me the grace to carry it. But I had to walk the way of the cross. The stations of the cross. So I went to my arraignment five days later and I went before the judge, Pilate, first station one, and I declared my innocence. Now, of course, Jesus didn't say anything, but I had to declare my innocence. So that's station one. Station two was just taking up that cross, just embracing it and carrying it. That's what you have to do. Doesn't mean you have to like it. You just got to carry it. You don't always have to like it. Doesn't have to feel good either. Usually doesn't feel good, right? But you got to follow Jesus, and he helps you carry the heaviest part of that cross. All you have to do is just hang on to him. So station three is like the weight of the cross. Jesus falls under that weight, and that's the weight of our sins, of course. But, you know, for me, it was all the gratitude and love that was coming to me from the world. It was overwhelming how positive and encouraging it was, how over the top it was. I walked into my parish, and my parish priest said, you're a living saint. Like, what? Do you no? Well, you're embarrassing me. You're devaluing the currency of sainthood by comparing me to a saint. But he said it. 
He was inspired by it. So your life is an inspiration. Your life, your witness to these young people here is an inspiration to them. They'll remember you. Don't be afraid to share your story with them where it's appropriate, age appropriate. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable with little people. They'll remember you. So these people were saying this to me. Well, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, former prefect for the Doctrine of the Faith, that was Pope Benedict's position under John Paul II, St. John Paul II, number two man in the Vatican, was in my home eating a sandwich with me and my son and my wife. And he said, you're like Dr. Martin Luther King. Have you ever heard of Dr. Martin Luther King? Yeah. I'm like, what? Like, this is what people are comparing me to. I'm like, who am I? It was a heavy weight. It was, it was too much to process, really. One person called me Joan of Arc. Mark Twain said Joan of Arc was the, the greatest human being that ever lived. That's what Mark Twain said about Joan of Arc. He loved Joan of Arc. 19-year-old girl saves the country of France? A peasant girl? Becomes a general of all... The only woman ever ahead of, all, of, of an army. Ever in the history of mankind. Other than Our Lady, she's head of the angels and saints. But you know what I mean? She's on a different plane. Amazing. And I, was, I, I, I just wanted to run from that. Like, you don't know who I am. But everyone was being inspired by it. They were being inspired by my wife and my seven children. They still are. Hopefully you are. Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't mean anything. Maybe like some weird dude came to camp today and he talked about getting arrested, mom. What's, this is a big deal. This is a big deal because you are next. And I don't mean to scare you. I mean, you're next to stand up for Jesus. You're next to take up your cross, to witness the truth. And some of you are already doing that. So station four, I knew was Our Lady and Simon at five and six, Veronica. I knew great consolations were coming. I don't have time to get into all those consolations, but they came. They came just the same, Dr. Seuss. Right? They came and the people were doing great things for us. Buying us food, handing us money. I mean, they'd walk up home and hang you $2,000 and you'd be like, crud. <laughs> what did I do to get 2,000 bucks? They would just say, here, let this help you and your family. Let this bless your family. Can you imagine people walking up, seeing you out, out at a restaurant and be like, oh, can I pay that bill for you? Oh, well, here you go. Take this. People wanted to help in so many great ways, not just monetarily, but with their love and support, the time. Friends that had long written me off called me up and said, how can I help you? So then I knew I was going to Station 7. What happens to Station 7? Do you guys remember Station 7? What happens? Second fall. Crud. Second fall. <laughs> fall again. A lot of weight. Jesus falls. I'm reading a great book by Louisa Picaretta, a mystic in the early 19th century. She said, Jesus, the weight and the blood, the sweat of the blood in the garden was all from the, all the souls that would reject him. He saw who all the souls that would reject Jesus' gift to them. That's where the, he, he, he was in a pool of blood in the garden. It wasn't just sweat drops. It was a pool of blood. The anguish of, over the fact that you and I would reject this gift, the loss of souls. So when I tell you this man writes that I'm back in church because of what happens to you, think of how much consolation that gave me, how much consolation that gives Jesus every time you say yes to Jesus and his love for you. But the seventh station is where you fall again. And I don't have time to get in. I want to tell you that just that Satan calls you by your name. Uh, excuse me. He calls you by your name for him, which is your sin. He doesn't call you by your birth name or your child name, your beloved sonship, your beloved daughtership. He calls you by the name of sin. He says, you are thief. You are murderer. You are adulterer. You are whatever. That's what he calls you by. And so the evil one was calling me by my old man ways. Because I wasn't always the guy I am today. I, you know, I, I struggled as a teenager. I struggled as a young adult. You know, I made some bad decisions. But by God's grace, I stand before you, a different man. But he knows it. The devil knows everything you've ever done bad in your life. Everything you've ever done bad in your life. And he likes to, like, fire an arrow at you that reminds you of that. And, you know, with all this weight and all this goodness coming at me, I, I felt, yeah, that's really who I am. I'm not Joan of Arc. I was at a talk once and this guy said to me, I feel like I'm standing next to Jesus Christ. 
Isn't that a little overwhelming? Who am I? That's not me. That's how he felt. Because I was witnessing to my faith in a public way and I was being persecuted for it. And that man felt that that was like Jesus Christ. But me? No. I'm just the guy that... I'm just the wretch. I'm the sinner. I'm the bad. I'm the... I'm this guy. And the devil said, yeah, you are that guy. You are that guy. And my shield wasn't all the way up. You know, the armor of God, you got to put the armor of the shield up, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, loincloth of truth, right? Gospel shoes, sword of, sal- sword of the spirit, the word of God. But my shield wasn't up. So I took some hits right into my, and I started to think, yeah, he's right. And for about a week and a half, I was like, he's right. But you know what I did? I ran right to confession. I was in confession every two days. Can you imagine go back to the same priest every two days and be like, hey, I'm back. And he's like, crud, you're here again. (laughs) (laughs) It's working for me. I got to use it, okay? (laughs) They laugh every time I say it. Okay, so so I'm I'm getting all this spiritual nutrition to help me. So I I read once that St. Augustine said, sometimes you got to wake Jesus up in the boat when he's asleep. You got to say, wake up, Jesus. You wake I need you. And he gets up. Don't mess up the video. He gets up. The fog rises and the storm is settled. The waves are calm again. And it was true. And I'm like, Phew, man, this is about end of November 2022. So December comes around and I got mo- Sister Jacinta, her mother, and her sister Miriam come to my house with a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Like, here you go. Spiritual novenas, bouquets, holy hours, masses. This is all for you and your children. I said, weep not for me, but my children who won't have their father very long. You see, friends, the government, when they sue you and they indict you, they have a 98% conviction rate. That means you're going to prison. That's what that means. They have every means to get you there. So I was preparing my heart for that. Why would you? That would be the smart thing to do. But aren't you a believer? I'm like, yeah, but how many believers were in prison? Like, how many believers died in prison? I'm like, it's not against God if God allows you to go to prison for a righteous cause. In fact, that's very godly. So I'm like, well, okay, I'm looking up online. What's life like in federal prison? You don't want to do that. You don't want to look that up. I was doing it. I asked my uh, board of directors, a former federal prosecutor, I said, well, I have any time with my children so you'll get about three months with your kids before they lock you up. I'm like, okay, good. Well, I'll get three months. I'll spend Christmas with them. And, you know, we'll be good. And he said, well, that's, that's if the government does, wants to be nice to you. Nice to me? No, they'll probably lock you up right away. They want to be mean to you. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that's happening. And I said, well, they're going to send me to Allenwood, PA. That's like an hour from my house. My family come visit me. No, they'll probably send you to Denver or Leavenworth, Kansas. I'm like, what? All right. So I was just preparing my heart. Just had to prepare my heart for this. So when the, nun, when the nun comes with her mom and sister and says, we're so sorry for you. I'm like, don't be sorry for me. I can handle this. Pray for this guy who can handle it. Pray for those girls, my four girls, who won't be really happy with this, this, this result. Okay? They need those prayers. Pray for my wife. So I'll speed this up. I got 12 minutes left. I knew Station 9 was coming. But you know, I was smart. I was like, I'm going to go to confession in advance. You know, you can do that. You don't have to go to confession when you're like in a state of sin. You can go there before that. Yeah, it's like communion and uh, arm yourself. I'm like, it's coming. I know he's coming back with his arrows. But this time the shield's all the way up. And I'm going to arm myself with confession. And you know what he did? He did come back and he... He did the same thing because he's smarter than us, but he always comes back to the old ways, the father of lies. And so once he started shooting them at me, it was, was about two or three days worth of anguish. And then I was set free again. So station 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 happened at the trial. Now, before the trial, I said to my wife, we need to go into deep, deep prayer. We need to pray like we've never prayed before. So we said, let's, we said, let's do all night adoration. Look, holy boldness, you got to ask these things. You got to do it. We're going to pray all night before the trial. My trial's on the 24th. I'm going to pray from midnight of the 23rd, 22nd, excuse me, the 
10 p.m. we're going into mass, and then we're going to adore all through the night from the 22nd, excuse me, the 23rd into the 24th. You follow me? It's the night before the trial. I got to get up that morning and go down to the court. My attorneys were like, don't do this. You got to be sharp. You got to be rested. I said, I have to do it because that's the only way I'm going to get through it. Boldness. Do you need sleep? Yeah, you need sleep. What does Jesus say to the apostles? Like, you know, where's the food? Have you eaten anything? I have food that you know nothing about. I, I take in from God, the Father, what I need. So I knew the Lord was going to provide all that I needed for my wife and my kids. And so we began that like a lamb to the slaughter. And we went the next morning after we were at, we emerged out of adoration and went down to the trial, Philadelphia. So what I'm about to tell you is real quick what happened at the trial. Basically, anything that you try to build up about yourself, the type of person that you think you are, the projection of you want yourself in the world among your peers, which is a good thing. Like, I want to be liked. I want people to think well of me. Just let that all go because that's all going to disappear. You're going to become exactly what they want you to become. Remember, the government has all the money they need. They have more money than you do. They can do whatever they want. They got the most talented lawyers that they can, they can pay for, okay? So you're going to become what they want you to become in the trial. So you just got to take it. You got to be a lamb to the slaughter. And you got to be bold. Just have that, how the holy boldness says, I can take this. With God's grace, we can do anything together. And so I just received it. Now, you don't want to overly laugh when you're on trial. You just want to be stoic. Just look ahead. Joy's watching you. They're waiting for a chink in the armor. They want to see you laugh inappropriately or at the wrong time. They want to make a case about you in their own mind. Like, this guy did this. Charged with these crimes. One year in jail for one of them and ten years for the other one. This man could do this. You don't want to give them any reason to think that. So you just look forward. And you have peace and calm. At least you try to stay peaceful. So for three days, the government put on their case. My son and I were going to be the only one. The boy back there standing up with the Air Force glasses on. That young man got on the stand to defend his father. Could you do that at 14? Maybe. Maybe not. He just had turned 14. Maybe you're like, hey, man, if I say the wrong thing, my dad's going to prison. I don't know if I can handle this, man. Like, please, somebody else. He's my, on he's my only witness that we're putting on the stand. Me and him. I can tell him I need you, but I'm going to honor him. And guess what? Defendants never get on the stand because they're always guilty. But I was going on the stand, and I did. So stations 10, 11, 12 is when Jesus is stripped of his garments, naked without shame, nailed to the cross. And on the stand, Mark and I both ascended into a wooden box that looks a lot like this above everybody. We were exposed. We were who we were and who we are. And we let... The truth be heard. So in the interest of time, my son comes off the stand and he does great. And he's still in the courtroom and then I take the stand. And I come off the stand and I said to my attorneys, how did I do? They said, you did great, but your son was better. <laughs> you can laugh at that. It's, it's, good, it's a good moment to laugh. I said, that's great. So my attorney's all distraught. He's like, yeah, Mark, I still think you're going to prison now. Sorry. I'm like, don't worry, man. I'm resting in the arms of Jesus and Mary, station 13. And that's it. I'm just, I'm in the arms of Jesus and Mary. I've run the race. I fought the fight. I can't beat the government. But we, we are who we are. We're called to give witness in the midst of all this, in this present darkness. There are powers and principalities that rule this age, this darkness. We just need to be light, friends, in the midst of that. So it goes to deliberation. You know what deliberation is? That's when the jury gets your case. The jury of your peers, which will be 12 people who will judge you, they will say, is the man guilty or not guilty? Beyond a reasonable doubt. So they got the case and we're you know, waiting for them to come back. And they come back after an hour and a half and they say, we're deadlocked. We can't decide. The judge says, can you try for a little bit longer? And he said, it won't, it won't change anything. And we're like, oh no, this is bad. We have a hung jury at best, which means I could be tried again. 
Okay, adjourn. I'm in the tomb for three days. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now, the day that that deliberation was the day I met my wife 16 years prior at a pro-life prayer vigil. That wasn't lost on me. The day my verdict was going to be rendered, the day I met my wife. And every morning we would begin with this and her words through it. I love you. Love you. That's how I would begin at the trial every day. That's called a helpmate. You want to find somebody like that if you're called to marriage that can support you. Good times and bad. So we went home and I just coached and, you know, and did what I needed to do on the weekend. And we would show up back for court on Monday. Well, there's a big problem in court on Monday. Like all these jurors are sending the judge like notes, like, you know, like you pass a note in like eighth grade. Like, I like him. Does he like me? And you know, let right back. Check this box if you like me, you know. Well, these things are being sent to the judge. You didn't do that when you were in eighth grade? I did that. You didn't do that stuff? No? You did it. Nah, she's like, I didn't do that. Um, so there's a problem. One jury is causing a jury member is causing a problem. The judge has to interview everybody in his private chambers. This is unheard of. Unheard of. It's miraculous that this is even happening. He kicks one of the jury members off, says, go home. You're done. He apparently was intimidating other people and causing a problem. We're like, oh my gosh, that's the one pro-life holdout. He's... He's hanging on for us. He's, they're kicking him out. We're like, oh, no. So they have to call for the alternate. This guy wasn't there anymore because they just dismissed him on Saturday, on Friday. He's like in Lancaster, PA. So we go out to get something to eat, and they bring him in. And after about less than an hour, they have a verdict. I'm like, oh, no. Less than an hour? So all he had to do was agree with what everybody else wanted. And we don't know. We're all thinking, this ain't, this ain't going to be good. Does anyone know how this ends, by the way? I'm not in prison. <laughs> okay. So we come back, and it's rendered at 3 p.m. What happened at 3 p.m.? Jesus dies on the cross. This is not lost on me, or it should be lost on you. So there we are, and the jury comes out. Now I'm starting to get really nervous. This is the last two minutes of presentation. I'm getting really nervous. I wasn't nervous during the trial. But I'm getting really nervous because this is this is my defining moment. This is it. United States versus Hulk. This is my defining moment, man. This is what God created me for. Here it is. You can see it all playing out. So the jury comes out. And I lean back to my sister. I said, prepare your heart. I'm going to be found guilty on the second count, which is the assault charge because I pushed the guy. But I said, don't worry, Mayor. God will take care of me. That's my sister. He said, what are you talking about? Said, don't worry. First count comes in. They said, how do you define the defen uh, defendant? We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty on the first count against the charge. That means I'm done. I, I never have to face that charge again, ever. It's dismissed. Forever. Acquitted. Never again. Unless I do something to somebody again where my son's being badgered, I guess. But be that as it may. So the second one comes. And I read and I open up the scriptures. And it's, Proverbs, it's, it's Psalm 57, which talks about being under the shadow of God's wings and how you're protected. Now, the early church fathers believed that that was the shadow of the cross. And I read that right before the verdict. And they said, we, the jury, find the defendant, Mark Houck, not guilty, right? So you got to know, friends, I was an inwardly very free man. Like, you know, they can't take from you who you are. They can put you in prison or jail, but you remain God's child always, always his daughter and son. That doesn't change. They can't take that from you. So whether I'm in prison or not, I'm still free in that way. But I didn't have outward freedom, right? They had took everything. I couldn't travel. I couldn't speak. I couldn't evangelize. They wouldn't let me do that stuff. So I found out that I had that restored. Like the prodigal son, I had that given back to me. And I'm looking at my judge, and the judge says, uh, Mr. Houck, you are free to go. No, that might sound trite, or, oh, that's, I see that in judge TV shows. <laughs> but hear those words as I leave you today. You are free to go. You are free to go proclaim my kingdom. You are free to go and be my child. And share my love. You are free to go and do whatever you want, good or bad. You are free to go and serve me 
or serve yourself. You are free to go and make a difference. Or you are free to go and do everything you want to do selfishly. So that freedom you have, and I have it back. So what are you going to do with it? My challenge to you is, what are you going to do with it? You're like, well, I'm doing good things. I'm helping at the Sacred Heart Summer Day Camp. I'm doing that. More. you got to do more than that, young people. You're learning in this school here. You're learning how to love. You need to take it into a world who doesn't know how to love. You need to share it with people who don't have never felt that ever in their life. You need to share with your family members who annoy you or your parents who you just really irritate you or your teachers or your workers, co-workers or your fellow students. You know, the ones that have hated you since you were in kindergarten, you know, or the peer group that hasn't accepted you or rejected you. You're called to share love with them because friends, if you won't, if you won't do that, if you won't share that love, Jesus won't be able to share all that he wants to share with you. He says, if you won't forgive, then the Father can't forgive you. you. See this? You see how your response to Jesus and his response to you? Augustine says he can never, the Lord will never save anyone without their cooperation. He's not going to save you without your consent. You have to consent to it. And that means you have to live a life holy and pleasing to him. Not a cruddy life, but a holy and pleasing life. And so I'm blessed that I could share this with you and introduce me. Can you guys come up here so they can see you? You mind just coming up here so they can see you? I know you're like, dad, these are like, you know, just come up. They need to see you. Ryan Marie, can you come up here? I just want to thank you on behalf of them. We've been traveling the country saying thank you to a lot of people. If you knew, how many of you knew about this before I got here today, knew this story? Thank you for your prayers. And if you didn't pray for me, the heck's the matter with you? Okay? But if you did pray, we thank you on behalf of Ava, Kitty, the coolest kid in the world, Mark Jr., Imelda, who's the cutest girl who ever lived, Joshua, who yelled out to the feds when they were taking me from my house, Please don't take him. He's my best friend. Remember that? Yeah. Therese Martin, who's just like the little flower. And of course, Augustine and my helpmate, Ryan Marie. On behalf of all of them, thank you guys for listening. You've been awesome. And we love you and we bless you. And we ask you to go and do all that God's asking of you this day. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God bless you. See you. Thanks for it. <laughs> All right, we went two minutes over.